Welcome to our podcast here today. I'm Jasenia, and I'm joined here with Carlo, Ravindu, and Hanya, and we're co-hosts for the sessions every Tuesday and Thursday. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that's really exciting for me personally. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot about it in the last year, especially, and I'd love to share, you know, my knowledge on it and hear everyone's insights. So we're going to be talking about how to win that job offer. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so today we'll be covering a, covering a bunch of things. I know in Tuesday session, we talked mo- mainly about networking and how we can leverage that to, you know, achieve your goals and reach what you want, want to achieve, basically. But I will be going a little bit more in depth into that, as well as some resume tips, cover letter tips, and then some best practices for interviews. So let's begin. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so to begin with the initial stage in the process of job search, um, oftentimes it can be the most challenging part. When you're beginning job search, a lot of the times you don't know necessarily wh- where, where to look or what, you're, what they're looking for. So I think that one of the key things is to really um, remember these three important principles. And that's something that I've always um, done throughout my time. And Um, I would say principle one is that they can't hire you if they don't know you. So it's really important to leverage all the different types of social media that we talked about last time, such as LinkedIn, Google. And then if you are a student in college or university, um, then your career center is always a big help. The second principle is to remember that how you conduct your job search gives clues to the type of employee that you will be. So it's important to remember that the interview is for a certain role or, or a position begins the moment that you start interacting with the firm or its employees. And these are really all indicators of how you will perform, perform on the job. So, for example, being proactive, resourceful and positive are all important because they really do demonstrate your character and how you will react um, you know, in a stressful job situation. And they tell a lot more than you know, even an interview could. And then finally, the final principle is to always remember that even if you don't receive a yes today, that doesn't mean it can change in the future. So as long as you are consistently networking with firms and with business people, you will remain top of mind if they are ever hiring for a role in the, new, in the near future. And, you know, since you have already built that repertoire with them, um, I'm sure that they'll, they'll be a lot more likely to reach out because you've kind of built that relationship than um, if you had not. So I have a question for you guys, if you don't mind pitching in. Um, have any of you guys, you know, implemented any of these principles throughout your job search and has it resulted in any success for you? I think I'll definitely speak to the um, <clears throat> principle number three. <laughs> Not getting a yes right away doesn't mean no, necessarily. I think that's like really, really important to remember. And we even talked about this uh, in our last presentation too, a little bit with Ravindu's example of <clears throat> he, uh, you know, networked someone who was really into a, a business that he was interested in, and then it led to a job later on, right? And I think just because you don't get a yes right away, it doesn't necessarily um, inhibit you from applying to more or things like it. Or like I said last time in the last presentation, you never know what one thing will lead to, right? So um, I think the remaining persistent point in principle number three is definitely like a key highlight for me that I've experienced. Um, And just like not losing that hope and and keep pushing through that. um, Maybe if you get a couple no's in a row, right, it's going to sting a little bit, but, you know, push through your ego a little bit and just keep going, keep applying, keep going for it. For sure. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I agree with him. I think even if you get no's, just keep going at it and eventually you'll get a yes, right? <clears throat> yeah for sure okay yeah i would on. say the third one definitely because i think like i always follow up and i always like network with them like later on so maybe not the job maybe like somewhere i start off a little and then maybe mm-hmm. get the job no and i think even you know the way you conduct yourself after after that rejection is super important too sending a follow-up thank you note you know telling them that that you're grateful for their time and if they can provide any feedback to you it it shows that you're connected to them and you know that you really do care and it's not like oh you know she she obviously shouldn't get the role and now she's 
bitter about it or she doesn't want to you know pursue us in the future so I think yeah, yeah your conduct like leading up to an interview <clears throat> after before it, it's all super important it just makes me think of the world of auditioning too in the theater industry and I mean now that the theater industry is hopefully opening back up again and opening up to stay um when you're auditioning right you're going to hear no often but a lot of the time being in the audition room is just a matter of them wanting to get to know you possibly for a future season or a season like way down the line right, right. so exactly what you said just any in terms of like remaining positive and like asking for feedback and maybe this is even dipping into principle number two a little bit but like doing your research on i mean for me it was like the theater company or the show specifically but also like doing your research on the company that you're applying for showed mm -hmm. that you're passionate and interested in that company and that like you're interested in just spending time with them and being there in the interview process to begin with. I think that makes a world of a difference too um, in the hiring process for, for any job or yeah. role. Mm -hmm. right? It's really interesting to hear it from like the arts perspective as well. Yeah. Okay. I think we can move along then. Okay. So moving along, I think it's important to note that the scope of job search has really changed over time. So it's not an, enough to just apply to over 30 jobs on LinkedIn or Indeed and, and hope to just hear a response. And more often than not, there is a very low chance of being hired or even receiving an interview from this process. So this is where, you know, kind of what we talked about last time, the importance of networking and receiving a referral really comes in. So when you when you do spend the time networking, meeting employees or I guess Carlo in the arts industry, it's other people that have worked in, you know, the same type of um, theater group or the same company um, and really communicating what value you can add to their organization, they would be a lot more likely to hire you. So stats show that there is a 14 times greater chance of being hired through an internal referral because there's the cre credibility from a current employee that you have all the skills and capabilities to do the job. So it really goes to show, you know, how building that those connections and spending the majority of your time on outreach is the most important part um, throughout the job search process. So this can really be done in like a four step process. So I like to break it up like this. So you, you first wanna identify and create a list of your target employers, whether, you know, wherever you're, whatever type of industry you're working in, you, you do wanna do your research and see what which ones would, you know, fit, the, fit what you're looking for in your career, but also um, what they can also provide to you and vice versa. So, then from there, it's important to find a potential connection for each target employer. So this can be done again in person, online, whatever you see viable at that moment. Um, and then your third step is to reach out to those identified contacts. And then finally, um, once you've reached out and had maybe a conversation or two, to remain politely persistent. Now, I say politely persistent because I think it's important to remember you don't want to be annoying, you don't want to be overbearing, but every, you know, couple of months or so, if you want to send them a note, note, see how they're doing, or if you read an article that you find really interesting that you think, you know, maybe has to do with one of their interests or the field that they're working in, it's nice to, you know, shoot them, shoot them a message and say, hey, you know, I was thinking about you when I read this, and that that's kind of how you keep the conversation going. Okay, so this is like a sample, um, you know, email or LinkedIn message that I kind of drafted if you are reaching out to someone, because I know sometimes it can be nerve wracking or you might not know exactly what you want to say or you want to do. So I, I, I gave an example of, you know, I'm a second year engineering student at X university and recently came across their profile on LinkedIn. Um, you also want to find a connection with them, right? So having them graduated from the same university shows that you do have a connection with them. I also mentioned that they're in the same club as me or the same association. Um, and then you want to state your interests so that you are eager to work this summer in the software engineering field and would love your insights on getting started in the industry. So once you state what you're looking for, you know, you always want to show that obviously you are cognizant that they have a lot on their plate of, of course more likely than not they are working full-time so um being polite making sure that you're saying thank you you're saying that you're really grateful if they even have 10 to 15 minutes um and then more likely than not if you do show that interest and you know it just happened to me the other day um they will they will reach back to you and 
they are going to be um, willing to have that conversation with you because again, you have reached out in a polite way and you are eager and you're showing that interest to them. Um, and in turn, you know, that's also mutually beneficial to them because it shows that they're committed to their company and they're willing to bring in more, more students or employees as well. So yeah. I love that point, Jasenia, about the uh, the time, because it like mm-hmm. even just asking them to arrange like a set time, like 15 to 20 minutes tells them that you recognize their time is valuable and that their time yeah. is important and that you get that they're extremely busy. And it would be like very valuable to you to even just have a simple converse- conversation with them about the industry. So I'm going to take a note of that and definitely put it in my book, I think, because mm-hmm. that's a, a perfect example to use um, in, in a professional environment when you want to get some insights on, yeah, on the business. Sure. Yeah. I think sometimes when, you know, you send a generic message, they, they don't know if you're asking for an hour, two hours, half an hour, but if you, if you do start small, then more likely they'll be like, you know, Hey, I, I'm free for this half an hour block or, um, yeah, I, I think it's always better if you ask for less and then, you know, they give more if they can. Absolutely. And I'm sure that most are, are grateful to give more whenever they can, but it's just a matter of that respect in how you ask that um, yeah. because they're taking time out of their busy schedules of busy lives and days that, you know, we have all experienced and, and had at one point and, and helping someone out. Right. So yeah, exactly. that's great. I'll move on to the next one for you. Perfect. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about setting up some chats. So we call them coffee chats here in the corporate world but I guess you know whatever you call them um and a lot of the times you know I think it can be really it can be really hard to meet a professional who you know is maybe double your age has a lot of experience and you feel like you don't know anything but I think that there are it's always good to go into something having some questions prepared um and I I think my, my my tip would always be to you know tailor your questions try to not ask super generic ones so that it shows you've done your research and you do, you know, you do, you do care about what they're going to say. So Carlo, if you just click on it a couple more times, all of the questions should pop up. So, you know, things such as how did they get started? You know, how, how do most people get started and what type of, you know, tips and tricks did did they use when they were in your role with it, whenever it was a few years ago, Um, asking them what they found, find most enjoyable. And then the other side is, What's really hard? You know, what are some of the skills that you need to be able to get through those tougher days when it's not always so easy? Um, How did your career path lead to what you're doing now? A lot of the times people start in something and then move over to something totally different. So I I always find it really interesting where when I hear a story about someone who, you know, began in one thing and then they realize their interests changed and all of a sudden they're in a totally different role or company. Um, and then I, I find this one's really interesting as well. And I think this, this could work for a variety of different like industries. And it's what trends do you feel will impact the field in the next five years? So I, I always feel like this one's interesting because it shows that you have like a forward looking mentality and you're interested to see, you know, what you can do to kind of prepare for the future and um, how, how things will change, you know, whether it's in the tech industry, there's always new things that are coming up. I, I can say in the arts too, right? Like, with COVID, I'm sure there's so many new things that they've been able to do like online that they couldn't do before. So yeah, I was wondering, you know, could, 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 could any of you guys, you know, kind of share your, share your insights or what you've gained out of having these coffee chats or sitting down with someone one-on-one? I'll, I'll interject real quick, um, just because yeah. I had a recent chat with a good friend of mine who works very closely within the tech industry mm-hmm. um, for theaters. And I'm sure everyone knows that theater right now, for the most part, is being done online, right? And um, it's actually going to change quite drastically, he was telling me. And this reminds me of, like, where do you see this field going in the next five years? But right now, they're developing technology that is going to work alongside augmented reality and virtual reality within shows in the future. So, like, more and more technology is going to be in incorporated into theater and just like shows and performances as in general so I'm super excited to to see where that goes but I can go off on a tangent on that forever <laughs> is, is that kind of like the hologram stuff exactly yeah, yes actually that. there's been a couple of videos I think it was a a football team that used it for the first time they used like a, a mixture of augmented and virtual reality to put their mascot 
onto the football field and have it run around the field. So they're going to do stuff like that in the future and like have augmented reality to like a very, very um, kind of like extreme degree that we've never seen it before, um, which is super cool. So you can find out like a lot of really cool information just by asking, like, you know, where do you see things going? Like there is, I've recently seen in an ad that there is a thing called Zoom Place now where they've started doing recently. So it's like, I know like because of COVID, like we've been on Zoom for most of the part, like besides holograms, it's like you could just perform your play by just like people just like watching you and sitting right from your home. So it's like a new thing too that they added. Yeah, and it, it reminds me of, have, have any of you guys ever, you know, gone on to NPR Music and seen the Tiny Desk concerts? No. Okay, so <laughs> definitely check those out. But those are really interesting because um, traditionally the whole idea about a Tiny Desk concert was that it found um artists that were kind of in a specific niche and then tried to make them a little more mainstream a little more popular but those concerts now are being done from uh live from the artist's home so the artist is like transitioning a piece of their home and doing the concert live and then live streaming it on youtube so i think we might see more of that because we still can't have too many large crowds all the time so that's super interesting but uh, another point to kind of get back on track um the whole concept of how did your career path lead to what you're doing now and is your career path typical it's always super interesting to hear people's stories and like their journeys and it's so funny how like how more often than not you'll hear someone say I had no idea I had no you know expectations of me doing this like five years ago but I somehow my journey and like I managed to end up here. It's, it's always super interesting because I feel like I hear that quite often um, in my industry, right? In, in teaching, acting, singing, whatever it is, I feel like I hear that quite often. Um, but I think that's a super important question be, to ask someone because it's a way of personalizing the conversation and it's, it's you're reflecting on their story and their personal journey. So I think that's a really important part to highlight for sure. And yeah. also like many people that you meet, like the many, the tons of uh, people I got to know, like they all had like at least three, four different professions before they actually went into what they're doing now. So yeah. it's like right. really a lot yeah. of people like that. Right, exactly. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna talk about that last question. Uh, what trends do you feel will impact the field in the next five years? I had a chat with um, one of the branch managers that I work with. He used to be an accountant before, right? And uh, he's one of my mentors as well. We actually um, went to his old hotel where he used to be an accountant, right? Mm-hmm. And they used to have four accountants there, right? And uh, all four of them used to work in the hotel. And this was before COVID. And when we went there, they actually got rid of all, almost all the accountants except for one. And that one accountant, she actually doesn't do the accounting. They actually sent the accounting paperwork to like a different, like their head office. And it's kind of crazy how, especially in the accounting field, I noticed this, is that a lot of companies hire accountants from different countries because it's, it's cheaper, right? So have you guys noticed stuff like that, like call centers, right? And other stuff. If you call like Pizza Hut, they're in like the Philippines, right? It's, it's, I know it's, they it's, tend to outsource it from like non-American or non-North American like um, uh, workers. But yeah, yeah, that's my extent of it. Yeah, but it just shows you how, like, in the future years, that a lot of these jobs are changing, right? And right. Um, it's really important when looking into your career. No, and I, I think I think offshoring is a whole whole another thing altogether. You know, you could even talk about because there's like two sides of it, right? It's like okay, some people will argue the fact that well, those jobs could have been going to people who are, you know, within Canada and stuff like that. But then there's the whole other side of like the cost, like efficiency mm. and how much you're, you'll be saving. So exactly. Right. Yeah. And especially with like taxes and stuff too. Right. That's yeah. What a lot of companies look at, unfortunately, but that's the truth. Yeah. No, true. Mm. Very true. I'm sure there are a lot of varying opinions about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, awesome. Should I move along to the next yes, one? Just any? Yeah. All right. Okay, so I guess these are some of the key take key takeaways from the networking portion. So, um, you know, professional etiquette is everything. It's super important when you're conducting in person or online um, to keep that 
really just grateful mentality that you are thankful for their time and you're also willing to learn and you know understanding that you you're not a know-it-all that you are always willing to put yourself out there and still learn more because I think that sometimes um, at least in my experiences sometimes I'll, I'll meet people who are my age just in university and the way sometimes they act is like they've been in you know an industry for 50 years and they think they know it all but I think that having that mentality when you're so young is you're closing yourself off from like a lot of different perspectives and learning opportunities. So I think it's important to keep your, keep your definitely your mind open and always willing to learn more. Um, Spending a lot of your time on outreach, connecting with people, um, following up and keeping that those connections, because of course, you know, if you are um, only messaging someone once or connecting with them once and not following up, then those connections do tend to, they don't stay as strong as they would have been before. And I think finally, the last thing is pay it forward. You know, if someone's helped you in the past and now you're, you've moved on to your career and you've had, you have some experience, then always be there for younger, younger individuals or people who are, you know, not in the position that you are yet, because I think that it's all like a cycle, right? You learn something and you pass it along and the same thing goes for, for everyone else, because, that's that's kind of how our world works. And I think if it didn't, then um, we, we wouldn't have like this great you know way of sharing knowledge and helping one another to expand their skills. So, yeah. Fantastic points. I think that um, a big thing for me and something that I've learned this year, especially, is that a big part of professional etiquette and moving forward in your professional career is recognizing all of the things that you don't know right so kind of like you said like not coming at it from a perspective of being like a know-it-all or like yes i'm like a hundred percent ready to take on whatever it is but still remaining curious right being in that curious aspect and recognizing that there are things that are always going to lead to improvement there's always room for improvement so i really really like that point um i think that really resonated with me for sure awesome Mm -hmm. Hey, let's go forward then. Okay, so now let's get into the second part, which is all about building your resume. Okay. Okay, so I want to go through a few characteristics of what I I believe are a professional resume and some tips that I think that everyone should be aware of when they're starting out. So, you know, first off, you do want to ensure that your resume is error free, visually appealing and has 100% accurate info. So, Your resume, a lot of the times, is your first chance to make a great first impression. Um, And having the basics of formatting and grammar are really important um, to stand out and show that you are detail-oriented. So the next would be to highlight specific actions and skills used to achieve a positive, quantifiable result. So I always I, I always like to, you know, if you've done something or achieved something, it's good to put it into number format a lot of the times because it shows actual substance and evidence that you've done it rather than saying, I increased this a lot or using very, you know, fluff words, I guess. But saying something such as, you know, managed a team of 12 and presented marketing plans to an audience of 40 students at weekly club meetings to 2000 community members, for example, like those show, you know, your, the, the scope and the breadth of what you've actually done. Um, and it gives an, a potential employer more of an idea. Um, and it does also show that you're being the most transparent and honest that you can be. So that's one thing. I think that the next thing is to really speak the language of Whoever read, whoever's reading your um, resume, they're your target industry and make sure it's engaging for all. So I know I, th- I know for sure, I'm sure you all could speak to it differently. Every industry has a different way of how you want to present yourself. I know what they're doing now and what's really interesting is a lot of places don't want a paper resume, but they prefer a video. So Ooh. I don't know, Carlos. Let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, so that's I've seen it a bunch on LinkedIn already, actually. Okay. And I know one of the banks, for example, Scotia Bank, they've completely removed resumes altogether, and they want you to complete a profile, which is a little bit different. You play a few games and stuff, and from those games, they extract some like information about the type of skills that you have. So it's really interesting how wow. you know resumes are kind of phasing out from the typical, you know, written to more of a video, because people are saying that the video does show more of your personality and who you are. 
That's so interesting to me because it seems that like you would think a bank, for example, would want to remain super formal in their hiring yeah. process, but for them to create a profile and play games with each other in order to, you know, land a job, that kind of seems like a really good time and like a good incentive to apply right. um, or to even just kind of, you know, meet new people. Um, but I think that to be honest, like that, that makes total sense to me because I feel like we're kind of tr- moving forward in this whole, like this one sheet of paper describes exactly who I am kind of thing. And yeah. I think that's actually super positive as, as an artist, right. It's awesome for me. Cause it just means more creativity can be shown throughout mm-hmm. a profile throughout playing games or throughout like all of those um, other new things that companies are trying. So that gets me super excited. I mean, I know that for for artists right a lot of the time we have to do we have to submit self tapes right so we've kind of been doing that for quite some time already but yeah. it would be super interesting to see that kind of move forward into the mainstream for jobs like applying for a bank like that's fantastic to hear right yeah no exactly mm-hmm. you would have never expected such like a traditional you know industry to to move away from that so ravindu anything you've seen um yeah it's actually really cool i haven't seen too much of that but okay. that's really interesting how that we're going from the traditional resume into kind of like video and kind of like they want to see more like your creative side right <clears throat> the, but do you guys think there could be some sort of um discrimination if there was a video what do you guys think about that i just want to pop that question mm-hmm. out there actually some jobs i applied to they actually require you to have video resumes and even the newer thing which i recently mm-hmm. noticed is a thing called tiktok resumes so you could see where technology and social media is going towards jobs because video resumes some places do need them let's mm-hmm. talk about that let's talk about the tiktok resumes what what do you mean by that i haven't seen that yet. It's recently a new thing. I recently watched notes. So I was applying for a job actually a few weeks ago and I found out that there's a thing called TikTok resume. So pretty much what you do is that you talk that whatever you say, you do have your resume with you, right? But you actually make a, you actually send a short video describing all your skills, what, like what you do and all that in a summary. And then you edit a little bit, pointing out your skills. And then um, what you do is you send it off to the employer and they are more than happy to see your TikTok resume as well as your, um, your resume that's on, on paper. So that's how it works. That's why I recently got shown. Wow, that's very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, I guess sorry we'll to the video then. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to kind of go back on Ravindi's point about the discrimination mm-hmm. part, I mean, unfortunately, that I think that that's going to happen, video or no video. I think that that that's something negative that just kind of happens. Um, but I would hope that people are using the videos for the right reasons, right? Yeah, and yeah. trying to get more creative with their hiring process. Right. Um, yeah. But it's really cool how that happens instead of, it's like so creative, right? It's not like that plain old boring resume. We're using yeah. videos and- Yeah, I so- mean, we've seen <clears throat> that format for, you know, applying to jobs for so long. And I mean, I don't know about, about you guys, but I've been in sort of like a, a job, situation where I've applied to, you know, a couple of Joe jobs and uh, I've just been sitting at the, at the desk with the manager or whoever was doing the hiring. And Mm -hmm. they've just been reading my resume while I'm like right there. And I'm like, kind of just thinking in my head, like, you know, you could kind of talk to me or like ask me all these questions, (laughs) but instead they're just reading all this list that I've made for them, which is totally fine. Right. I mean, there, there is some use to that, but it, it's, uh, it's so exciting to hear that, like I said, big companies like Scotiabank are like moving towards new ways of um, looking at people. And I think it's like this, if I can say like, they're not just creating like carbon copies of each other in these like resume formats, like, oh no, I'm a human. I'm a person. Mm -hmm. I have like individuality and like traits that make up me that I can show you um, will be great. And I will be a great addition to your company. Right. So that's super exciting. Very, very cool. ATA system, what employers use is, so it's like, it's like a kind of system that they have. So it's like where they figure out, they have the job posting there and they see if your traits and your skills fit towards that. It's, it's a new system. And it's, it was like, I don't know how new it is, but it's been there for a while where they use the system to figure out who is the potential candidate. Yeah. And I think that's something that actually a lot of companies are starting to move away from a lot of the times that you know, companies would take your resume and just put it through this online mm-hmm. scanner, essentially, that would pick up the words that they're looking for. And if you met it to, you know, 90%, okay, you're called in for an interview. But 
I think they're trying to take more of a personable approach because honestly, I think what they're realizing is that you can't tell about a person's skills and qualifications from a sheet of paper. You need more than that. So yeah, it's yeah. nice to see. I hope that, you know, it results in more like inclusive hiring for sure. And um, I think, you know, Ravindu, what you said about the discrimination that, yeah, of course, that's that's a huge, huge problem. And I think we could have a whole another session on that, how there's so many biases and everything in, you know, in in hiring. And we I took a whole HR course and kind of we, we talked about that throughout. So I find that really interesting. But um, I, I think, you know, I think it's going to be I think it's going to always be there. But hopefully, hopefully now, you know, th- there are so many you know, policies and procedures and a lot of, you know, these these rules that companies have implemented. So we can only hope that they they take action on that. Love it. Shall I move on, Jasenia? Yes, Next slide. Yeah. Formatting. Yeah. So I just want to go over this pretty briefly, but this is just some general formatting. You know, when you are making your resume, you don't want it to be four or five pages because ultimately I think they say that um, the average recruiter spends six or seven seconds just scanning a resume. So they're not spending a lot of time. If you are having a super long one, they're probably not going to consider you for the role. Um, so it's important to just highlight your most important and the most relevant ones to um, that job. So I think a lot of people take the approach that it's a one size fits all type of thing, your resume. But in reality, it should be consistently updated and altered to the position because otherwise, you know, all, all, every single job, even if they are um, in the same field, but they are slightly different, they, they do have different requirements. So it's important, again, to do your research and make sure that you've hit those points that they're looking for. Um, and yeah, I think the other other points are just to keep a you know professional type of font and make sure that everything's lined up appropriately, um, your spacing's correct, and you are putting the correct dates in as well, and you're consistent. For example, you know, if you're um, going from saying months to then jumping to only putting in the years you work there, that's not consistency. And it, again, it does show poorly on your part if everything's not looking uniform or one way. So I want to ask one thing. Yeah, sorry, go sorry. ahead, No, okay. just, just a quick thing about the, uh, the length. I was just going to say that that is definitely industry specific, that one full page or, or two full pages maximum, because I've seen Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people be like, oh no, I prefer it just to be one page. Cause like you said, just any, like, I'm just scanning that like six, yeah. seven seconds really quick. Yeah. Or like, a, uh, I've seen like a front and back thing done as okay. well. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're told to only keep it to a maximum of one page. So, right. yeah. What do you guys think about like softwares that help build your resume? For example, like job bank. And, um, I know you can use indeed for typing your resume as well. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, there's a lot of services now that offer that. And I think even there's like quite a few paid services too that will help you format like sentence structures that like make you sound like much, much better. I don't don't know what what the the goal is there, but what's that? Penro is actually one of them that actually helps with the resume uh, like services as well. Okay. Yeah. Have you used it, Hanya? I tried it once, but then it's like, I felt like I was better doing it on the word instead. Yeah. I, I guess my only thing with those things are that I feel like a lot of people are using them now. And then if you're all putting in your stuff, then I'm sure, you know, things are essentially coming out the same. So and how different can you be? How, right. Exactly. Yeah. How, so, how, how can you stand out if everyone's doing that? Doing yeah. that. So, yeah, I, I tend to stay away from those. But I think if you are like a first timer starting out, then it's nice to see kind of what what you're expected, because, yeah. It, it, it is like, I feel like resume writing and then writing anything else is totally different, right? You have to really concise exactly what you did for a period of, you know, maybe a whole year or more in just a couple of lines. So it's definitely mm-hmm. hard. Yeah. I'm sure we're all um, aware of that Chrome extension Grammarly too, just yeah, for writing Grammarly. in general. Yeah. I use it all the time now for my assignments and I love it. Of course, I, I just use the free one, but I find it super helpful as it, it catches kind of anything. Yeah. Um, and that can be used for, you know, papers or resumes. I mean, me and Jasenia were just talking about how many papers we've got going on, but um, okay. yeah, for, for writing in general, and especially if you're formatting a resume for the first time, right? Like definitely get that free extension and, and just try it out in like a Google doc. It's definitely worth it. Now even Microsoft yeah. word has like a resume extension as well, which, you know, right. yeah, okay. so they do. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. It is. They'll, you can like put in a, the, the field that you're, you know, for example, if I put in accountant, 
then it'll give you examples of like good resumes that other accountants have used. So you can kind okay. of take yeah, stuff from there. So it's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Move along. Okay, so I just wanted to go over kind of when you're creating those, what I like to call accomplishment statements in your resume, um, the three main points that you do want to include. So you want to have definitely the action, um, context, and then what you achieved. So your results and your goals. So, you know, brainstorming actions, whatever you've done, whether it's managed a team. In this case, I used an example of independently conducted um, it could be, you know, resolved a conflict. It could be a, a, a variety of things, but to show exactly what that action was and then moving on to the context, what you did exactly. So here it's independently conducted market gap analysis to identify new business opportunities. So that shows, you know, your action and then the context of what the situation was. And then you do want to wrap it up with your results or your goal. So what was the impact that you had, that your actions had on the team or on the business or in total. So in this case, it was that you yielded 18 new contracts and increased sales by 20% within 12 months across the client group. So here, you know, I think this is a good example because again, they used um, numbers to quantify. So it is, it does make it a lot more believable. Um, and it does show if, if I was reading this, for example, that, wow, you know, increased sales by 20% within 12 months. Like it, it gives, it gives me a time frame, and I know exactly what they did, how long it took them to do it and what they did. So I think it really covers that, like who, what, where, when, why, you know, uh, framework. So this is, yeah. this is super helpful and like very interesting to see because I feel like I could have used something like this in high school, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Or even just applying to, to any job, right? Like forming these accomplishment statements. We should really be uh, empowering youth <laughs> to go and do more of this stuff and help each other form these, like, look at this example. That, like, that example that you just read is, like, perfect, right? Like, if I was someone who was hiring, like, someone just based <laughs> off of that, that gives me so much information. They've done the math. I've seen they've done a good job, right? And they're independent about it. I mean, that that says everything you want to say. I guess is what I'm what I what I'm going yeah, off really of good. there. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. Another note to take for my book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think like obviously this is on a higher scale. You know, yielding eighteen new contracts. But if you're in high school or you're a student, like you can use it for anything really. Whether it's working in a group project or on a team sports, like it doesn't have to be anything super technical. You can really like tailor it to whatever you're working on. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So we have a quick video on some resume tips for students, but I know we are running a little bit short on time. So I think we can continue along. So we'll just say, if you wanted to watch this video on your own, write an incredible resume, five golden rules in 2021 is the title there. Yeah, and, uh, no, it, it is really helpful. I've watched it myself, so do check yeah. it out. Oh, maybe we can post the link then in, the, uh, in the description. Okay. Okay, so now <laughs> I want to do a little activity with you guys. So I want to hear about your thoughts about the format, content of this resume, and what he did or didn't do right. Hmm. I just think it looks a little bit goofy, personally. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's super distracting. I'm not, yeah. like, the font is too small, and then he's got the picture, which I feel like is not 100% necessary, as well as that image on the left there. Um, I, 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 think, I feel like those are just very distracting, as well as that chart on the bottom where we've got Italian language 15%, keeping it cool 100 Yeah. So I don't think that those are are necessary and, 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 the, and the title <laughs> like the title font too is not good like you know, the shadow coming onto the bottom yeah not uh, super professional exactly no. yeah. exactly yeah, Those yeah are the skills, like uh they don't explain much like there's only like percentages in there it should give it uh explanation on there mm -hmm. <laughs> No, and there's not, you know, yeah, he hasn't really given those quantifiable skills. He didn't use any type of that same model we were talking about. What was the context? What was the goal that you achieved? So, and of course, the formatting, the colors, it's, re it's really unnecessary. And 
in I, I think when it comes to resumes, like simple is always best. So yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. But it's funny though, so it might get the it is, attention. It is. Yeah, it, it, that could work to his benefit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you never. Know. I think it depends what you're applying for. <laughs> exactly, I think, exactly. I think so. Yeah. I think if it was for a, a creative resume, he might yeah. take the cake on that one. <laughs> but I'm also noticing he's using words like uh, "like." So in, in the first sentence there, he. he 2015 to present helped like 50 customers per day. I can just kind yeah, of picture him good. saying that. It's not, <laughs> not the best wording, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, let's go to the next example now. Okay, what do you guys think about this one? I personally think it looks good, but it's too like straightforward. Like, you know, no kind of flair for me. It's detailed. It's detailed, it's good, but like no flair. It looks like every resume out there. Right. I'd say it's yeah. pretty, yeah, it's pretty clean. Um, it's a lot. May I say that? I think I think <clears throat> there's a lot of things on here. No, um, that is for sure. And I think, you know, he definitely doesn't need to include all of the experiences. For example, he just mm -hmm. used the relevant ones like the 1992 to 1993. That's, you know, pretty, pretty far back in time. So I would only, you know, choose <laughs> a few of them and expand on those more. Yeah, um, you're right. The more recent the more things recent, being the most important. Exactly. Yeah. And you depend know, I, on what he's applying for, too. I think you had to change like your work experience, depending on that. Like, for example, if you're right. You know, doing sales, you don't want to put something like, oh, I was a good writer, like, you know, something that doesn't relate to that. Relate to it. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I always like to include, I think, in interests or a skill section is always good to have um, and to make it a little bit longer because it does show your personality. You know, when you are seeing so many mm -hmm. resumes that look exactly the same like this. Um, you know, I always like to put something fun in my in my in my skills or interests. For example, I, I would put likes to play Monopoly. And I've gotten that so many times like, oh, so can you, you know, what are some of the skills that playing Monopoly has taught you? And then we can go into a deeper conversation about that. Or I would put in, you know, I'm interested in, you know, the NBA, NFL, NHL sports type of thing. And that would always be like a tying or a connection with someone. So I think it's also important people sometimes overlook the interests, but um, that's kind of your differentiator when everyone has so many experiences these days and you know sometimes you feel like none of them are truly unique because there are so many people looking for that exact same job right yeah. um yeah no I was just gonna say like Ravindu like like kind of like you were saying like you could put everything that you've done on your resume right <laughs> like you could definitely do that and it would probably be super impressive and like super long but it would kind of end up looking like this yeah and I feel like like, I don't know about you guys, but I've definitely changed my resume around for the job that I'm applying for, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not going to put things that aren't relevant to the job on there. And I feel like, like what you said, just any about the, the age, right? The 1992 to 1993, that's not too current. Maybe yeah. if it's like super important, like, yes, keep it. But yeah, keep it current, keep it up to date. And I feel like there's a lot going on. So yeah, for sure. Is there another one here we take a look at or just Overall, no, that's, okay. those were the two. Yeah. No worries. So, okay. um, yeah, I think those, those were some of the tips for the, for the resume and, um, with your resume obviously is your cover letter. And I think a lot of the times your cover letter can be as equally as important or sometimes even more important than your resume, because that is where you're kind of showing off who you are. You're telling a little bit of the story to the recruiter and, um, you're giving them a little bit more insight than what your resume just shows, right? So let's get into some tips for designing your cover letter. Okay, so to make your letter, cover letter stand out, I've kind of outlined four, four tips. So you do want to start strong. You want to start with a captivating and, you know, an, an attention grabbing opener. Um, and that could be really, it depends on the, your industry, what you're in, but definitely something that you know, shows your interest into the field, shows your interest into the company specifically. Um, maybe you're, you know, demonstrating something that you've done in the past that you think that would really shock them or leave them like, wow, this is a good candidate. So you do want to start strong. Um, and then the next thing is to tell your story and be genuine about it. Be open and honest about, you know, what you've succeeded in, in the past. What are some 
challenges that you face along the way, but in turn, what have you gained from those experiences? And then I think the third thing and one of the most important things is to provide evidence about it. You know, you can say a lot of things, but if you're not backing that up with actual experiences or um, proper key examples, then it doesn't communicate the same value as it would have. Um, and then the final thing is to position yourself to their need. And that's, again, where the research comes in and really understanding what they're looking for from a candidate or an employee and how your skills match up or align with that. So, yeah. Oh, can you guys expand a little bit on, you know, what you guys have done in the past when making your cover letters and what are some of the some of the you know pros and cons? What have you seen and what have you done that have helped you or maybe you feel like you, you could have improved on? Um, I think would have been having a short and, and a concise story. That's really important. Yeah. On top of that, you have to make sure that you sound professional in the beginning and at the end, because that's how employers approach to you. Yeah. And third of all, if you want to start off strong, you have to make sure that you that you sound like that you're different from the others. So that's important thing that counts in there too, as well as your resume. For sure. I absolutely agree with Hanya. I think that's, that's excellent. Um, <clears throat> I've always kind of struggled with cover letters. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I find them kind of like a daunting task. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm like remaining personable and professional at the same time. And I find sometimes that can be a bit of a difficult balance. Yeah, it is. Um, I agree. Yeah. And, and it also like, it always depended on the job that I was applying for. Of course, if it was a theater um, industry job and position that I was applying for or a role that I was going for, um, cover letters tend to be a bit easier because it's just more about telling them about yourself and your experiences. Right. Um, but yeah, when it came to actually applying for a Joe job, right, like at a coffee shop or something like that, I found cover letters to be extremely daunting. So I took a lot out of this, out of this uh, checklist for sure. And I think, yeah, just like maintaining that balance, right. But like remaining professional, but also letting them know like a little bit about yourself at the same time. Yeah. So for sure. no, I'm no, going to no. keep on discovering that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and- I agree with both of them. I think I can relate to Carlo. Like, cover letters aren't my thing either. But uh, yeah, this is really good and kind of understanding and learning learning how to write it better. No, I, I agree. I don't think they're easy at all because you also don't want to make sure you're not really like regurgitating the exact same information that was on your resume because then what's the point of it, right? It, it should be. It should be something that definitely makes you stand out. And I think in my in my experience, yeah, telling a little bit of a story about yourself that you feel like would connect with what you're applying to is always something that lets you be personable. But at the same time, obviously, your tone is professional. So, yeah, let's continue along. Okay, so these are some of the four pieces to include. So you do want to have the opening to capture the attention of the reader. Um, then you want a connection. So an insightful link between you and the employer. So I think this is always, you know, a a great tip um, that I would always give someone. And it's if you've had any interaction with the company or any of the employees, um, it's always good to, you know, mention that in your cover letter, say, you can ask the person who you spoke with, if you're able to mention their name in their in your cover letter, and if they give you the permission to, then I think, you know, saying that you've had a discussion with them, and you really felt that, that discussion went well and you see that a lot of the things that they, they they talked about the organization fits with what you're looking for and in turn your skills also you know relate with those um that's all that always shows that you've kind of gone the extra mile to do some research and connect with someone who already works there um and then the match so your skills and qualifications whatever you're talking about in the cover letter should directly correlate with what the, what the job description is, um, what the company is looking for. So obviously, you know, if you're, if they talk about someone who's organized, detail oriented, a good communicator, you should, in your story, you should definitely mention those things that what you've done in the past to demonstrate that, you know, you were, you were detail oriented, whether it's, you know, managing a team and making sure that you were aware of deadlines for a group project. Those are all examples of it. And then, um, I think the last part would be like your close. So you, like your call, your call to action that you you are super interested in the position and you would love to, you know, take the next step and have an interview. Um, and then obviously the thank you at the end to wrap it up with your with your and with all of your contact information, your phone number, your email address so they can contact you. Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So here's another example. And um, 
again, if you guys don't mind maybe taking a quick look at it, scanning it briefly, let's see some of the pros, cons of it maybe. Um, it looks super long. Yeah. Yes, th I was just thinking that. <laughs> this is a, an essay. Yeah. <laughs> if I was your point, I would be like, yeah, I'm not reading this next. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I think that's the yeah. main thing about it. You know, Normally, she could have written three paragraphs. Normally, no, she could have written great things about herself, but this is the first thing that kind of deters anyone from looking at it because it is so long. It has too much information. Um, and you, you do want to keep something that's more clear and concise when it comes to stuff like this. Um, it's funny because mm. it says worst cover letters on the top there. <laughs> oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think this, yeah, this is a, a very comical one, right? Yeah, there's a lot of sentences here that I'm just reading, like right at the end of the approximation of hate veil commenter, I'm seeing get a job flipping burgers and stop complaining, you tax stealing communist. I mean, <laughs> this would be a hilarious read, I'm sure, if someone had the time. But if someone's applying to a job and they're flipping through like hundreds and hundreds of cover letters and resumes, yeah, this is not going to stand out because they're going to take one yeah. look at this and be like, not reading an essay on no. to the next. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Okay, let's look at the second example. Okay, so in my opinion, I think this is a lot more concise and clear, you know, it does have the opening. And then I really like how they have like the bullet points here and it gets to the point. Um, you know, resilient problem solver, for example, relationship and team builder, I don't need to read this entire thing to know his skills. So I think that's something that really stood out to me. And the fact that, you know, it's not super long, it, he broke it up into paragraphs. But yeah, what do you guys think? I like this format a lot. Yeah. And I like the indents with the points in the middle. Um, my names are, or I'm immediately drawn to that section, mm -hmm. as opposed to the like, dear insert name section, I think like I would read this like middle beginning and then end if I had the time exactly. I'm like I'm, my eyes are going straight to those points for me personally so yeah I agree this is a good format and this is I think this is what is much better than the last one for sure mm -hmm. no I agree yeah and I think that you know having like the bolded um point form it it highlights those things that even if someone is sk skimming over it for five, six seconds, they can just read those points and then go, go on, go forward. So yeah. Awesome guys. Yeah. That's a great way of kind of narrowing it down, but also telling them who you are at the same time. Yeah. Exactly. That's super interesting. Makes, makes me think it's a little bit less of a daunting task. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay, so our final section for tonight is about acing that interview. Now, I know interviews can definitely be a daunting task in the beginning. You know, it's your first time really face to face with an employer or maybe multiple people if you're having a panel interview. But I do think that, um, you know, like everything else, practice does improve and it takes time and everything you know when it comes to interview prep is it's not an overnight thing but if you do keep at it consistently and continue practicing and you know do it with a peer or maybe like a career coach who can give you some well you know well advised feedback then that's kind of your way to go for for interviews so yeah now I just want to ask you guys what are your what are your tips I guess you can go to the next slide Carla um, what are your best tips for interview prep and how do you, you know, get over those nerves? Because it is a really daunting and nerve, nerve racking task for sure. I think for me, it's just, you just got to be yourself. Right? And I uh, know just be a hundred percent you, because if you're not you, they can, anyone can tell when you're lying. Right? So if you're truthful and you're an honest about what you say, you most likely have a better chance of getting hired. Like, for example, I tell, if I had an interview, they're like, um, do you struggle with this? I might say, yeah, I might struggle with it, but me, my personality, I'll, I'll work harder to learn that part better, right? So okay. that might make the employer be like, okay, he's telling me the truth, not like everyone else, where they just say, yeah, I can do anything, right? right. So that's my tip for interviews. But yeah, I know. I love that. I think being honest is so important. And because, yeah, everyone will walk into an interview thinking that they're Superman and you know act yeah. like they take on any any task and they're perfect at everything but that honesty and transparency shows that 
A, you know, I know I'm not perfect and B, I'm willing to take those steps to improve. And I want to do it with you guys because I know that you'll help me along the way. So. I, I love that. In, That's a great point. In my opinion, when you do get the question about like when, how do you see yourself in five years? Then the tip is always talk about the position that you're talking about and how you see yourself in the because that is one thing I've noticed. If you put that in there, whenever they ask you, then they know that you want to work with them. If you talk about here or there, that whatever you want to do and overall in your life, that's not how it works. So that's that's what I know for experience. Yeah, definitely keeping it more um, on the professional side. You know, if, if they are asking you things about, um, you know, it, it was funny. I think some people, they start out a conversation with tell me about yourself and then they go off. I think it's important to include some of your interests and, and things like that, but one time I was doing an interview and I asked him about a time where you showed good communication skills and he kind of went off on a long, you know, tangent about how he was staying connected with his long distance girlfriend. <laughs> and that was kind of, you know, a little bit uncalled for where I was like, okay, I guess you are showing me your communication skills, but I was looking about for it more in a professional, professional setting. setting. Yeah. <laughs> <of course. laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit interesting. So you do want to definitely stay stay focused on that. Right. That's not bring in too much of personal stuff. Sounds like he was missing his long distance girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I tend to have a ritual whenever I go into a, in a, like an interview or an audition because I get super nervous beforehand and yeah. I start to like get super in my head and then I'm not able to do what I'm able to do. So right. Number one thing I do is I make a po- um a playlist of my favorite songs. And I jam out to that because it gets me out of my head and into my body and just like not thinking about it and not overthinking about the situation. Right. And um, Mm -hmm. number two, I have this like, I don't know if you want to call it an affirmation, but (laughs) it kind of is. And it's why would you ever doubt yourself? Mm -hmm. What have you got? What, why, why would you ever doubt yourself? And Mm -hmm. I just found that to be the most helpful thing ever when it comes to like, really hard auditions or really hard like interviews or you know things that I'm kind of nervous or scared about Mm -hmm. um and yeah it's it's been super helpful I mean like also just like the knowledge beforehand of going into it and being like it's not the end of the world if this doesn't go 100% how I want it to go exactly and just takes off all the pressure like my shoulders roll back I can relax and breathe again and you know, the weight of the world isn't on your shoulders off this one audition or this one interview. It's never really the case. No, and you often sure. do much I better. Think, I say something similar. I always tell myself, you know, what have you got to lose really? Like if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen for you, then it was a learning experience, right? You're still exactly making something out of it. So well, I want to ask you guys a question. I know um, right now because of COVID, there's a lot of online and Zoom interviews. How do you think you can prepare for a Zoom interview and how would it be different than an in-person interview? Um, log in five minutes early, dress like how you would be at an interview and also just follow all the tips that you do at a regular interview in person. That's all we have to do. At least with their top half, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until, the ca- until the camera falls over and then they're like, oh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know people who've had this, like when they're for them when they go for Zoom interviews, they just have their top part ready. They're like, they're, like they're still in their pajamas, like halfway, and they're still giving. I can tell you guys, I'm doing that right now. So, <laughs> I would say invest in like a thirty dollar seven twenty or ten eighty p webcam. That's what I would say. Like, make yourself stand out in quality. I think and they will remember you well although that's not like a make or break in terms of it being necessary but i think if you're gonna like if you know you're gonna be maybe sometimes working on zoom taking classes on zoom whatever it may be if you're gonna be doing stuff online i would say invest in that like spend the 30 dollars, get a webcam that makes you look good and makes you sound good um i think in terms of professionalism that's going to make all the difference for an online interview yeah Yeah, i I also think the background also is a big thing because like for example, like if you're in your bedroom and there's like a lot of messy clothes, mm-hmm. it's like the employer is going to look at that and be like, oh, this this person is not, you know, really good, right? Or if you have a nice, clean, like white wall or even a green screen, at least it makes you look more professional than the other part. Yeah, definitely. Right. No, I think those visual aspects are super important. Um, but just to touch on, you know, for the actual interview, I think since you're not there in person, it's still important to add a few, you know, you're not able to shake their hand, you, but 
you're not able to show your hand gestures as much. So I think adding in some personal touches, you know, whether it's, you know, being a little bit more personable, being funny, a few more like things that you feel would make you stand out or you're not able to convey From as my well experience, I really don't screen. like panel interviews on Zoom throughout like literally panel interviews and it's not so hard actually it's like i know it's it sounds hard like doing panel interviews but it's actually really easy you just have to make sure that you're really easy going and you follow all the steps on how you do interview and it just and it just turns out fine that that's what that's what i know from my experience yeah and, and i think honestly doing them from home sometimes can relieve a lot of the stress of you know being at this big building and having to walk take the escalator here and meet all of these people along the way at least you're in your comfortable environment so I, I honestly, I think I prefer doing them over Zoom now because it's just become more comfortable that way. You, you can have some notes set up on the side, whatever it is, so. For sure, there's that comfort, that comfortability with your desk set up, right? I think that's been a super nice, uh, nice thing yeah. for me to have throughout my time at university. I've got the dual monitor thing going on, my notes on one screen, my class on the other, right? Kind of makes you Talks feel on like the other. you're, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're ready to like take on the day or like take on the world. And then, you know, yeah. you've sat in the desk for a couple of hours and you, you're kind of, at least hey. me, because I'm, I'm getting a bit older now. You know, you got to roll your shoulders a yeah, bit, move, yeah. do some stretches. But <laughs> yeah, no, that I could go off on that too. That yeah. was amazing. I think those are some amazing points that we talked about today. And just like super helpful to go on about this resume building and like cover letter building um, techniques. Because I feel like I could have used way more of that in my experience going through school. And I wish we would have talked about it or even like had more open conversations with my peers and colleagues about it. Um, but I feel like it's kind of this thing that's just like everybody's expected to know how to do it. And there's not a lot right. of workshops out there to discuss it or talk about it. So amazing. Oh, techniques. Exactly. No, I think it's very valuable to have like some resources out there that you can go to because because, yeah, we are kind of expected to know about it, but but yeah, you know, I think we are cutting close to the time. It, it is past. So, Carlo, if you can just go to the, to the last slide. Thank you all so much for joining us. You know, we really appreciate you guys coming out every Tuesday and Thursday and listening to us. And we hope that you've taken some piece of information away from the session. And again, as always, we always say, you know, if you have any topics in mind that you'd like us to speak about in the future, do send us a DM on Instagram or Facebook or send us a send us an email, you know, whenever you'd like. And thank you all, Carlo, Hanya, Ravindu, for being so interactive and for, you know, answering all the questions. I Really appreciate it. And yeah, no, it was great. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you again next week.